Hi, and welcome to Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. Today, we're going to talk about the evolution of evolutionary thought. I know, the evolution of evolutionary thought. I use evolution a lot, but that's okay. And of course, I have to start with this quote from Theo Dobzhansky that says, Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. I know, I love that quote. But what we're going to talk about today is I want you to know that science builds on previous work and it also requires a curious mind. And this is important to understand how we got this theory of evolution by natural selection. I mean, Darwin, he didn't work in a vacuum. He's been influenced by others. And we even know if we go back to Sir Isaac Newton, he said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And that was Isaac Newton. You know, and Isaac Newton was by far one of the smartest and most brilliant scientists ever. And one of my favorite scientists is Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan says, curiosity and the urge to solve problems are the emotional hallmark of our species. So think about that. When it comes to science, we're not working in vacuums here. We're building on the shoulders of giants, and we also require curiosity. Without curiosity, there is no science, because we'd never ask questions. So the whole point here is, Darwin, he didn't create the theory of evolution by natural selection out of thin air, right? He was curious. He had a curious mind about the world around him, and he was influenced by other scientists. So who could have he been influenced by? I don't know if he was influenced by this Greek philosopher, but evolutionary thought's been around for a really long time. So Anaximander lived from about 610 to 546 BC and uh, somewhere around modern day Turkey. And you know, this guy, now according to some Roman scholars in 300 AD, 900 years after this guy lived basically, and they report, that Anaximander said that humans came from fish and that life started out in the sea. Now, his other ideas beyond that were kind of odd, so we're just gonna leave it at that. But the point here is that for over 2,500 years, people have been thinking about the origins of life and the origins of humans and this idea that things change over time. Now, Carl Linnaeus, he wasn't into species changing over time at all. But he's an important figure. And the reason why is because Carl Linnaeus went out and started classifying organisms based on similarity. So he came up with what is called the Linnaean classification. You know, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So he organized life based on similarities. And we're going to come back to that because it's important. Now, in biology circles, especially when I was an undergraduate, we made fun of Lamarck. But Lamarck, in the early 1800s, nearly 50 years before Darwin published his Origin of Species, Lamarck actually came up with one of the first testable hypotheses of evolution. And of course, he came up with a testable hypothesis called acquired characteristics. And we know that that is not necessarily how evolution works, mostly. Um, when we get to another series on epigenetics, You'll learn that, yeah, what happens to you can be passed down to your children and your grandchildren. It's just not in your heritable features like your DNA in terms of changes of that. He thought that if you were running fast in your life, then your offspring may also run fast because you gain the ability to run fast. And of course, the, the giraffe example. Stretch your neck further. Stretch your neck further. Interesting, huh? Another major influence on Darwin was his friend, Charles Lyell. He was another gentleman naturalist, mostly a geologist. Now, Charles Lyell wrote The Principles of Geology, you know, one of these really important books that most of us have never read, but I can tell you the gist of it. Well, I can tell you something really important from it. He came up with this idea of uniformitarianism. Think uniform, all the same. And he realized that the key to understanding the past lies in understanding the present. So he realized that the geological processes that are operating today operated pretty much the same in the past. And this was important 
because by realizing that mountain building was slow or erosion was slow, you realize the earth was old, really old, much older than thousands of years. It was perhaps millions of years. And this is also very influential to Darwin's work. Another figure that was influential was uh, Thomas Malthus. Now, at the turn of the century, 1800, which was 220 years ago, the human population reached 1 billion for the first time in our history. And Malthus was actually worried that we would have too many people because he realized that any population is capable of exponential population growth. And you're familiar with exponential population growth. You got 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000. You get the idea. Yeah, I've practiced that before. I didn't just do that in my head. I've, I've practiced that. But at any rate, all populations are capable of exponential growth. But we rarely see that for very long in nature at all. And then, of course, there was Darwin's friend, Alfred Russell Wallace, who um, influenced Darwin in maybe a lot, maybe nothing, but he sure got Darwin to publish his work quickly. And uh, Alfred Russell Wallace is a unique figure. He's much younger than Darwin, and he was in Indonesia when he got malaria. I was sitting in a sweat lodge and basically etched out the theory of evolution by natural selection and then mailed it to Darwin in 1858, which Darwin received it. And uh, Darwin looks at this and goes, man, this guy's basically got the same theory as me. Darwin did the right thing. He presented both of their works to the Royal Society in London. So he didn't just uh, push this guy away. He actually presented both their works. Darwin, of course, gets the credit for evolution because Darwin had been working on it for decades. So let's talk about this. Darwin's been working on evolution for decades. Now, this picture that I'm showing, Darwin was actually a little bit younger. He was actually my age when he published on the origin of species. Well, three years older than me. Yeah, he was 50. Oh, am I really getting that old? Man, what happened? Well, let's talk about Darwin's journey. To me, you know, understanding how Darwin came up with the theory of evolution by natural selection is really interesting. And there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about. So, you know, this thing about science, you know, not only are we building on the shoulders of giants like Charles Lyell, Malthus, maybe Anna, Anaximander, I don't know, but it also requires a curious mind. You, you got to ask questions. You got to be curious about the world around you. And Darwin was a good naturalist from the get-go. He had a propensity for natural history, collecting rocks, and beetles, and barnacles. So, you know, he's um, about 22 years old. He was born on February 12th, 1809. Same day as Abraham Lincoln. What a great day for the world, right? So in 18... 31. Darwin is 22 years old in the summer. His dad is very successful and his dad is like any other dad. Charles, what are you going to do with your life? One of Darwin's mentors realized his ability to collect was a good naturalist. So he asked him if he would be interested in going as a proper dinner companion and the ship's naturalist on the HMS Beagle. Now he's going to be the dinner companion to the Captain Fitzroy. See, he was of the right social standing to be a dinner companion. And captains were often very lonely and suffered a lot of mental anxiety on these ships. So Darwin, of course, said, yes, this is only going to be a two-year trip. He wanted to get away from his dad. He said, yes. His dad said, no. Luckily, Darwin's uncle talked him into letting him go and also financing his trip. Now, the primary purpose of the HMS Beagle's trip well, it's a map South America. And uh, that was what it was going to do. It's going to be a two-year trip. But it ended up taking five years to boldly go where no naturalist has gone before, to seek out new life and new fossils and new theories of evolution. Right? That was Star Trek Enterprise. They went on a five-year mission to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly split infinitives, which I constantly do. I know, I just made an English reference in a science class. It's okay. 
1831 to 1836. Now, they left port on December 27th, 1831. They were supposed to leave December 26th, but Christmas was the day before. The crew was a bit hungover, so they had to wait till the 27th. Now, of course, Darwin had never been on a boat in his life. He gets on the boat. They're in the port. Nice, smooth sailing. They turn out and they get out into the open Atlantic Ocean in December. And it starts rocking. And Darwin got seasick. And Darwin was often seasick on the boat for months at a time. So he tried to get off as much as he could. And uh, while he was on the boat, he didn't have much. But he did have Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology talking about geological processes. Now, Darwin spent about 3.5 years in South America. What was he doing? He was making collections. He was collecting birds and mammals and reptiles and insects and, and other arthropods and fossils. And he was shipping them back to England. And he was becoming famous. He just, I guess, focused on, uh, on making all these amazing collections. Now, that's important, right? Because if you're making lots of collections, you're making observations. He's starting to see patterns of diversity. He's seeing that things are closely related to each other. He's seeing that you have a species and there's variation on these species. He's looking at fossils and going, wait, these things don't exist anymore, but they have similarities to us. Hmm. Making observations and being curious. Now, at the time, um, you know, Darwin's making all these fossil collections, but not many people understood the age of the Earth. Except he started realizing it was old. I mean, he started buying into Lyell's principles of geology that the Earth is old. And one of the clues came in the Andes Mountains. And he's hiking. He's up there. He's like 12, 14,000 feet up in the top of the mountains. And what does he find? Seashells. Seashells. The tops of the mountains... Those rocks were once underwater in the ocean. And he gets back, and there was an earthquake. I mean, Chile's got a lot of earthquakes going on. And this mussel bed was popped up out of the water. And Darwin realized, wow, Lyell's right. Given enough time, that eventually that fossil bed could be thousands of feet high in a mountain. It just takes much longer than what we have in our human lifetime. So after three and a half years on South America, um, they start trekking across the Pacific. And one of the first stops they make as they leave the mainland of South America is the Galapagos Islands. Now, of course, these are incredibly famous islands for evolution. They are on the equator. And these are youngish islands. Now, Darwin has been collecting for three and a half years. And what he notices is that on this island are all of these unique species. They're unique. They're found nowhere else in the world. But, but, they are similar to species on the mainland. Right? There's all these different species of finches. They're called the Darwin finches. Well, they're similar to finches in South America. Like, on our finches up here, like the house finch. They're giant tortoises. Well, guess what? There's tortoises on the mainland of South America. They're iguanas. And if you look at my picture of the iguana, I took that pic in Costa Rica on the beach. I saw another one sitting on a log. One rainstorm, and that one's out to sea. So the idea is that, yeah, the Galapagos Islands had all of their species, unique species, but they were similar to the mainland. Why would that happen? Now, this is challenging the current thought of the day. It was believed, you know, everybody thought that the Earth was kind of youngish, or most people did anyways, and that all species were created kind of perfect at some point back in time. It's called typological belief, and it came from Plato and Aristotle. In fact, Plato came up with the typological belief, and Aristotle came up with the great chain of being. The great chain of being, of course, uh, you've got higher and lower life forms. So a lower life form would, of course, be a worm, higher would be a dog, higher would be a bird, Higher would be a human. Wait, I just put birds above dogs. <laughs> Ignore that one. So this typological thinking, it's based on a specific norm. There's a perfect type. 
And any deviation from that type is a deviation from perfection. So this snowy egret, he was posing for me, right? He probably thinks he's a perfect type. And the idea is that if you deviated from that, from that perfect type, that's a deviation from perfection. So there's no need for anything to ever change. And that was a common belief back in the 1830s. It's also held by Captain Fitzroy, but Darwin was changing his mind. And that's interesting because they had some arguments about that. Another question, you know, Darwin started wondering, why were all these species different on these different islands? It's not just the Galapagos that has unique species. Every oceanic archipelago, which is a group of oceanic islands, has their own unique species. And guess what? They are most similar to the closest mainland. And Darwin is like, why? Why have all these different species? If you have typological thinking, where all species are created at some point in the past, why not find the same species everywhere in the world, right? So here's a Eurasian collared dove, a house finch, and a house sparrow. These birds are incredibly common. They're invasive. They're found worldwide. Why not just have the same species everywhere? Why have this change? So, you know, Darwin gets back off his boat, right? And um, he spends the next 20 years going over his specimens. He's collecting additional data. He's uh, he's looking at pigeons. Yeah, I know, he bred pigeons. He's looking at dog breeds and what we've done with artificial selection with them. I mean, think about this, a five pound chihuahua. Its ancestor was a hundred pound wolf. Yeah, a lot of selective breeding there. You like cauliflower, mustards, Brussels sprouts. That's all wild mustards. So he spends the next 20 years collecting all of this data. And then in 1958, he gets this letter from A.R. Wallace basically outlines his theory. Now, fortunately, Darwin had been corresponding for the whole time with friends, so there was a clear line of record that Darwin had the origin of species. He just didn't want to publish it because he knew of the fallout from it, but he also didn't want to get scooped. So his buddies like Huxley were like, you need to publish this. So in 1859, Darwin published on the origin of species, and it quickly sold out. And then he worked on some other stuff, and it was actually his friends like Huxley that supported the theory of evolution by natural selection. And surprisingly, over the next 30 years, till the early 1890s, the theory of evolution by natural selection actually slowly fell out of favor, even though it was quite popular when he came. And uh, so that's going to be the topic of my next talk. So there it is. Those are the events leading up to Darwin coming up with his evolution by natural selection. Now, just remember that uh, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, this is a theory to explain why species change over time. So stay tuned for my next videos to find out what the theory of evolution by natural selection is and uh, what the evidence for it is. Until next time, this has been Tom Kennedy Science.